Okay. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, today we will be talking about MBSC data interoperability. Uh, Mark Williams will be giving that presentation. Uh, a little bit about Mark. Uh, he's a model-based system engineer at Boeing, and his main focus is the underlying data standards. Uh, he's also a student of the large-scale systems integration technologies across the aerospace industry. He has 35 years of aerospace design experience, uh, including a wide variety of systems and subsystems, equipment components, transport elements, networks, and software. Mark has developed multiple design automation and verification tools and has co-authored five U.S. patents covering techniques for PDM correlation, subsystem verification, viewing, editing, very large data models, and the variation of integrated design hierarchies. He's also been the sole author or contributed to over 60 internal and external publications and is the project leader and moderator for MBSC work teams supported by the INCOSI, PDS, and LOTAR trade associations. Mark, you take it away. Also, uh, for the uh, attendees, uh, if you have any questions for Mark during the presentation, please put them in the chat and I will record them for after the presentation is over. Thank you, Brandon. So I am um, first wanting to recognize our sponsors, Anarch. Kubatech 3D and TransMagic. And because of our sponsors, we're able to share these presentations through the next several months. And of course, GPDS is made up of partners. And I'm going to talk more about the partners in just a minute. First, a little history about GPDIS. So the Global Product Data Interoperability Summit is a communications hub for advanced industries. It's a place where we share our knowledge through the exchange of ideas, solutions, and methods. It's a place where we build consensus on the data, the tools, and process standards based on the experience of our individual companies and, of course, the solution providers, our sponsors. GPDIS is a unique organization focusing on the core data representations and delivery systems that we use in our businesses every day. They drive our industry. We rely on the solution providers to demonstrate their technology and success stories. GPDIS encompasses model-based engineering including 3D MBD, MBSC, computer-aided manufacturing, CAM, product analysis, product support, and the emerging, changing, ever-changing technologies. So the depth of the experience within GPDAS extends from a very vibrant vendor community through the large OEMs into the lower tiered suppliers and down into small business. So it's important that we recognize who the membership of GPDIS really is. So now the question, how is your model-based enterprise functioning? Are you still dependent on paper documents to manage your design and manufacturing businesses? Have you engaged your supply chain to understand your digital transformation? Have you established a process for data exchange across your product lines throughout the supply chain? So those are questions that we often ask when we hold these individual seminars. And so let's recognize that this digital transformation is a journey, and it is the role of GPDIS to help you develop a map for that journey. So we're pleased to partner with SIM Data and their upcoming PLM Roadmap event. PDES, 
and their manufacturing maturation of the step standards. Historically, we called PDES product data exchange using step. Also Northrop Grumman, Parker Aerospace, and of course the Boeing Company. And let me also remind you that following my presentation will be a presentation from Phoenix, who Phoenix Integration, who is going to follow up with their own presentation. So my presentation today is about the interoperability of the architectures that we author in our companies. And this is a working group that is sponsored by the Aerospace and Defense PLM Action Group, sometimes referred to as A&D PLM. And so this team has been together for a little over three years and it includes a, a wide variety of companies where we all contribute both to what we are going to investigate, what are some of our bigger problems, and how we're going to report out and make progress through the PLM vendors and through our, our executives that represent us in the Aerospace and Defense Action Group. So here's the problem. We are challenged with the tools that we use to create our architecture models. The tools work very well, but we do not have a process that supports the exchange of those digital models across our industry with our suppliers. And so the aerospace OEMs and the suppliers are working for a solution that enables their transition into this digital business. And we think it's very important the architecture really represents the core of, the potential core of our modeling process. So what should we test? How should we identify the problems? And what solutions can we propose based on this issue? First, let me take care of some definitions. What is an architecture model? In this case, we describe it as system architecture models. And so I'll go to the formal definition in the 42010 document. And there are also supplemental descriptions as to how the architecture drives the design process. And the tools we use are called architecture description languages. And so to be an ADL tool, you must comply with these standards for 2010. Let me also define behavior models. So in this case, these are the analytical simulations that we create to demonstrate the behaviors of our products. They are sometimes called system or structural plant models or control models. They have a specific formation of lumped parameters in the way that they address the mathematical formulas. And they may include executable code, really based most of the time on differential equations or discrete equations but it's also described as physics-based modeling. So the term MBD is used in different ways. Earlier I described 3D MBD, but the model-based design tools, and that, that definition for that acronym actually comes from the 50s, is based on the unification of mathematical models of how to solve complex equations. And these types of models are really not suited for our architecture ADL tools. More definitions, the PLM vendor. So we all have our own enterprise and our selection of a PLM vendor. And so that product lifecycle management tool has really been a boon for our progression of digital transformation. The ADL vendors, and there's quite a few of them, 
but the type of products, the standards they may represent include Arcadia, Archimate, SysML, UML. There's, there's a pretty good selection of ADL languages available. And then there are third party vendors. And this definition describes those vendors that are not necessarily ADL vendors or PLM vendors, but instead have a niche product that supports integration, exchange, or alternative representations of our models. So several years ago, we started with a light switch. Let's all go build a view of the light switch using our architecture models. Let's embed the requirements into the models and let's exchange them and practice if we're ready for the industry to transition to a digital architecture method. So they were very simple. We pretended like we each had roles to play and so we each took the turn of being a supplier or an OEM. And the goal was, was to make a change to the model and return it to the originator and to be able to identify the change. Unfortunately, we did not have a lot of success. We could essentially tease the requirements out of the architecture models, but oftentimes we lost the understanding of the architecture basically due to the lack of graphics during the exchange process. So the industry today is, is made up of many different companies. And so there are um, higher level um, government and consortiums that help us with understanding what some of the opportunities are in our industry. And so DARPA, that's the Defense Agency, or the National Institute of Standards, or the Research Institute from Texas Tech. They estimated and came up with a pretty sound uh, description of how we were losing a billion dollars per product during its life cycle based on our inability to exchange digital data. So that's a big carrot. And making that architecture model flow and, and mature during the process is also fundamental. So without model integration, we resort back to the legacy solution of exchanging documents. I can't give you my model and enable you to read it, so I've got to transcribe that model into a document that defines my architecture, where the requirements are applied, how they've been decomposed, and how you validate that design with your behavior models, assuming that that role has been extended through the supply chain. So that tells us that the digital transformation of our industry is, is going to run short without a clear path for the digital thread and eventually the digital twin. So all of us have our own TLM systems. And we didn't want that. We don't think we should change that. And that's true through the supply chain. They have their own PLM systems where they have trained their employees and have set up an IT infrastructure, invested money. And so we think that everybody's design that they have in their particular enterprise is probably a core competency, how they've set up those tools and arranged their organization. And yet still, the OEMs, we use many of the same suppliers. I mean, a Boeing, an Airbus, an Embraer, um, we are all using the Honeywells, and the Rockwells, and the Raytheons, and the Talus. We use the same suppliers, and we do not want to inflate their cost due to our PLM system. So that drives the cost of the product up. Instead, we want exchange based on everybody's unique PLM system. So let's get back down to MBSE. 
we describe MBSC as really the integration of three model types. Now, there are many more, and I'm leaving out the physical spatial representation. In this case, during this design development process, we're talking about requirement models, behavior models, and how they unify with the architecture model. So what we learned during our initial exercises is the exchange of requirements and behavior models is actually reasonably mature. We can do that successfully. But exchanging the architecture models has been the big challenge. The view of our supply chain. Imagine an OEM, a Boeing or an Airbus. And what we see across the OEMs is the predominant tool is SysML. Systems Modeling Languages, one of the ADLs. SysML is managed by uh, the Object Management Group, or OMG. And then we communicate baseline with our Tier 1 suppliers, and those are the big heavy suppliers, the Rockwells, the Honeywells, and so on, where we see a growth in the use of a language called Arcadia, but they still use SysML, and there are other products. And as we go down the supply chain into the tier twos, we once again see a greater split between different ADL methods, or in some cases, they're using office automation tools like Visio or some type or PowerPoint, or they don't even have the capability in house. Back to MBSE. On the left is a picture that's out of historic systems engineering documents. The first time I saw that view was Space and Missile Command Handbook, which was published in the 80s and now is part of NASA. So requirements feed the functional analysis, functional designs, where you iterate the requirements and mature them. You validate them with analysis and control models, and then you synthesize them into what we call the logical representations. But historically, the term was synthesis. On the right is the digital view. Design requirements managed digitally feed both the behavior and the architecture models and they are all unified with consistent traceability and methods of understanding uh, the common parameters and shared requirements. And so you see two green stars, meaning we feel good about exchanging requirements and behaviors, but we are challenged with the architecture exchange process. This roadmap comes out of a joint consortium of PIDES and LOTAR, which are two groups that work on not only the step standards, but also how to preserve and archive data for long-term use. And in this group, we looked at the MBSC languages and standards and tried to build a map of what that progression looks like and who's related to who and where do we see some of the biggest opportunities. I should also mention a shared partner of the AFNET, that's a French group that participates regularly in our meetings. In addition to the names at the bottom in COSI and NASA and NAFEMS, uh, the, A the Aerospace Industries Association and the equivalent in Europe, uh, the Aerospace Standards, Defense Standards, So here's the plan, is that we will develop use cases that describe the MBSC model exchange that includes the architecture models. We will extend those use cases to make sure that we evaluate the language alternatives. And then we will test that capability against the tool vendor capabilities that we think we have identified across the industries. And then we'll score those tool vendors to see if there might be an opportunity. And we earlier have published a paper that is available on the SimData website 
that derives the desire to identify third-party tools that can support our exchange needs. So here's an example of a use case. The graphic is not easily readable, I'm sure, but in, we also have just released a position paper that will also be available on the SimData website very soon where you can dive into the details of these models, these use case models, and the specification that uh, we derive from the process of exchanging data. And so in gross terms, the OEM, the system supplier, and then potentially a tier two or tier three supplier further down the supply chain. And we build this on top of the standardized systems engineering V model in order to support both the definition, verification, and validation of the results. So, Three, three basic processes, being able to specify the design, to be able to verify and validate that design, and then be able to ensure that the development project is complete and integrated at the end. So there are specific features of this use case that say exchange is mandatory that when you get to a certain step, you've got to get feedback. And you don't want to slow down or limit your process based on a document-based exchange. And so that, that helped us derive five different use cases. As you can read the definitions, we are really going to focus on use case three and use case four. So these deliverables that occur based on this exchange need to be recognized as a stable product that all of the OEMs will essentially be able to understand, define, and use. So back to the languages. Currently, most of the tools are implementing SysML version 1.4, 1.6 has just been approved. And it is very popular, and there's about 20 different brands of tools available that support SysML. However, there has been a rapid growth of what we call the Arcadia methodology. Arcadia was developed originally by Talus, and the tool that implements Arcadia is called Capella. So it's, a, it's built on top of SysML. It's actually built on top of what we call the Papyrus product. And Capella is a very powerful tool, but includes a framework and methodology that drives you through the steps. SysML is a big painting palette. Any color, any shape is supported. Arcadia is very specialized specifically for the design of products. And so it tends to be a little bit easier to train a, an organization, a work for, workforce, and the tools are typically a little cheaper. And Arcadia is also supported by a major PLM vendor. So you can see a description of what is makes up Arcadia. So we decided it needed to be part of our study. It can't be just SysML, that many of the architectures that we see that need to be exchanged will be built based on the Arcadia method. But the office automation tools need to have a mix, a role to play also. Differences between SysML and Arcadia, it's really very, they're very similar. They use some different words, but Legitimately, SysML to Arcadia or SysML to SysML, Arcadia to Arcadia is already supported based on the strictness of the uh, current implementation and that the primary tool that people use is Capella. So Capella to Capella is, is really not an issue. So I said I was going to focus on two of the use cases. Use case three the specification. In our company, we call it the specification control definition or document or drawing. 
historically. So this functional specification defines what we need the tier one or tier two to accomplish. Provide a pump and ensure it functions like this, has these interfaces and so on. So we want to use this as part of the buy package, this specification, this architecture model, and we want the receiver of this model to understand how it was developed and how, how it needs to be used and that they should reuse it and update it and send this back results based on the product they intend to provide. So we asked for this range of performance and they updated the model to say, our product can achieve this different range. And then we can start the negotiations or maybe it's even bigger than the specification provided. So in this use case number three, in our analysis, we broke down that out of the nine or eight different standard diagrams that are available in the ADL tools, these are the specific diagrams that really are needed for a minimum set of um, architecture definition that supports the functional specification. So in this case, we're looking for the minimum required exchange uh, properties. So these specific diagrams are the ones that need to be exchanged. When we look at use case four, in this case, in this particular use case, we use an observer model by which the product is validated. So we've provided a specification for the previous use case and using use case four, it's how do you validate that specification in what you provide, and that's based on an observer model. The observer model typically has three types of diagrams, whether it's SysML or Arcadia, so that we have a common understanding of, of the results. Okay, so this ADL exchange challenge. So we think it's actually possible point to point, there are two um, supplementary st data standards that support uh, the exchange of SysML, but not all tool vendors implement those capabilities or they add their own proprietary representations. And we call those two standards canonical XMI and UML DI and that's the diagram inter interface. So there is a new SysML standard coming out called SysML v2, and they've been working on it for several years. We expect to see it available in our companies within about two years. But unfortunately, SysML v2 does not guarantee data exchange of these diagrams. However, the specification was extended to it to extend, was extended to include alternatives, alternative standards for exchange. In this case, an API exposing the application program interface using REST, RESTful services, and a, a discrete way to implement REST is through OSLC. So there are already several vendors that expose their API, and that has opened up the, uh, the opportunity for these third-party tool vendors. So there can be reasonable success. In fact, several of the tools today expose enough of their API to where exchange is, is literally possible between brand X and brand Y. But like I said earlier, there's 20 brands available. So success is not necessarily guaranteed. So System LV2, this is a chart out of their presentation, and they talk about the three alternatives of OSLC, a RESTful interface, or using a Java API, and the services required. And uh, this was presented by Sandy Friedenthal at, in COSI last January. 
So the alternatives evaluation. So now we have the results of our exchange of what we think we can exchange. We have our use cases. Now can we build a list of criteria of what those translation products need to be able to support? And in this uh, example, it's probably a little fuzzy for you. You see company one, company two, company three, and there's actually two different types of exchange tools, one that literally do model to model and a different type of tool, a service tool that literally takes your model, puts it into a, um, a database and then churns out the alternative representation. So probably a little more horsepower, but uh, maybe a more expensive product or takes more time. Regardless, we match the same criteria. This is the minimum of what we need that includes those specific diagrams identified in the use cases. And in this evaluation, we evaluated 12 different products, and I described the two categories, and there was approximately eight on one side and four on the other. And we could not find one particular dominant solution out of the group. And it was very hard to benchmark those capabilities because we didn't necessarily have the time, energy, or, or resources necessary to be able to hands-on evaluate each one. That's actually an upcoming part of our project. But there was also a challenge in the, in the business case as to how much a company was willing to spend to support this exchange. So how much investment are you gonna to add to your IT infrastructure in order to support a multi-product exchange? And this um, alternatives evaluation actually narrowed down a subset of those 20 brands to approximately six, eight brands that we thought were the most widely used products across the industry. Okay, so we built the use cases. We built a list of the artifacts to support those use cases. We provided a mapping between the different primary language types, created that alternatives evaluation and scored the different tools and have published a white paper now to expose those results. But maybe there's some alternatives that we haven't examined in order to support exchange. So interoperability within the standards is, is meaningful because now we have a way to collaborate and update each other's models, and that's really the big goal. So maybe we can develop an implementers forum of where multiple companies demonstrate hands-on their own ideas, what's been success is very much like GPDIS and the overall capabilities of each individual ADL product. And maybe bring in those third-party vendors to support that implementers forum to help us understand where some near-term successes may lie. And Maybe get a couple of the major tool vendors, PLM vendors to participate and help us understand what some of the opportunities are using their tools. But regardless, without a common exchange method, we really think that the only near-term solution is via the PLM vendors to adopt a third-party solution or for us to actually enlist the support of a specific third-party solution. So there's many issues, and <laughs> we uncovered a lot of challenges during this study. And that is that the tools are changing, the technology is changing, the vendors offering tools are changing, new versions every week. And how many companies have actually adopted MBSE to be able to take advantage of the exchange of architecture models. Not all companies are at the same level of maturity in this trail for digital transformation, on the trail to digital transformation. And then once you have a translation, how do you know it's good? You need really a secondary process or tool to validate that translation. 
and sometimes our models are obfuscated and protected by IP, and it makes that translation tool choke on its own data. And then, as I mentioned earlier, is the IT infrastructure costs and the labor costs to support translation. Do you have a dedicated group in your particular company? Do you have an IT service? Do you hand the tool over to the engineer? So there, if you look at the third-party translation tools, the majority of them are dependent on the exposed API from each one of the major, major ADL vendors. And therefore, those tools are changing and they need to continually update their own translation product to stay, to stay up to speed. And then there's the investments. There's many investments that we have internally relative to standards, new technologies that we want to implement, and, you do, and if you want to see an IT executive get red in the face, let him recognize that he has redundant spending on two products that may perform the same function. Okay, so the solution cost potentially is high, and now we're in this pandemic period, and we haven't seen a lot of alternatives thrown out from uh, other solution providers, although there are some very good engineering services out there that help us with data integration. And if we wait for, v for SysML v2, is it a cost saver? And the decision was no, is that we really need the assistance of these third-party vendors today, that our businesses haven't stopped. We need to develop the next product. We need to understand what our internal strategies are relative to the use of these tools. So we're gonna maintain our focus on the data standards listed there and hope that through momentum, through groups like GPTIS and the large PLM vendors and the large OEMs that we can drive the industry to commonality. So we published our, position, our latest position paper, and next we're going to define the requirements for that exchange, the specific protocols, and maybe narrow down the list of what we try to exchange, and then set up some type of interoperability forum or implementers forum to test our ideas and to validate the criteria that we established in that alternatives evaluation. And some of you may not be aware of a capability that's in the public domain called the Model-Based Engineering Demonstrator Reference Models. It is a GitHub facility where you can store your models for, for practicing this exchange process for demonstrating capabilities, for demonstrating some of the translation products, and it's available to all of you with application. So this is a great opportunity for us all to engage in this experiment, is how do we exchange architecture models? And we're also going out to some of the different uh, standards consortiums and enlisting their support in helping us with this endeavor. Okay, well, I think that that's the last slide, and I'm ready to address questions. How am I doing for time? Oh, I said 40 minutes. It took me 40 minutes. So, uh, I do not have a camera. For security reasons, Boeing did not issue me a camera, so all you got was a little snapshot at the beginning, but I'll be glad to retreat through the presentation, share some other details, or discuss something that is interesting to you. And it looks like I overwhelmed you. Yeah, so we have 15 minutes um, for questions.
So, Lily, it's a first. Nothing in the chat. I so, am – go ahead. Uh, well, we have a uh... – so are these uh, standards organizations oh, good. open to anyone? Very good. So what are the standards organizations? I'm going to pop out of presenter mode for a minute maybe, and uh, no, I'm not going to pop out of presenter mode. Yeah, I am. Okay, so I'm going to drive back to the chart with the roadmap. No, maybe not that way. Uh, one more here. So there are many, in fact, the standard bodies are actually in competition. You know, anywhere somebody can start a business. But some of them have a really clear focus on systems engineering or these types of tools. An example is the work by OMG or newly formed the Modelica Association that's really launched some new capabilities relative to behavior models. The question is, is joining, and you can join as an individual member, as a single company entity, or your enterprise can join. And some of the examples of those groups, and I'm gonna blow this up maybe to make it a little bit easier. So W3C controls the web. And of course, we're talking about RESTful services. And up on our chart, you see Sparkle, and you see uh, these RDF technologies and OWL. That's within the domain of W3C. OASIS has OSLC and a lot of our document standards. Modelica, like I said, is behavior models. Everybody knows the International Standards Organization. You have reached Nirvana when your standard is recognized by ISO. PDES is focused on STEP standards, LOTAR on archiving, AFNET, really the French Industries Association, but they contribute in many different places to the development of STEP standards and others. ProSTEP, IVIP is really part of, uh, well, it, it's, it's worldwide, but uh, the majority of the members are part of the European Auto Association. Uh, the International Council on Systems Engineering in COSI, that's a worldwide organization. Uh, their last conference was held in South, Af South Africa, previously in LA. Uh, I think they are time to go to Seville, Spain next, and Hawaii. Uh, everybody knows NASA, the National Space Agency. NAFEMS is finite element modeling, or the SMS wing of NAFEMS is for systems modeling. So many of these uh, organizations accept, like I said, individual members or enterprise members, and there's a way to stay engaged. And, and in the case of OMG, anybody can join a working group. You may not have a vote outside of that working group, but you can certainly participate and add your two cents. And did that answer the question? So is it open to, is, are these organizations open to everyone? And I'm gonna say yes. And if you want to participate, you can either go through your corporate entity or apply directly. Now the reference that I have on this chart is the um, European radar chart from ASD, Aerospace and Defense, and uh, they have some of the best references for defining the individual standards available on the web. Of course, you can search the web and look at uh, a lot of different resources, but in terms of one-stop shopping, ASD radar chart is a pretty good place to start. Okay, any other questions? And uh, you don't necessarily have to throw it into the chat. Uh, I will take a, a verbal question. So how do you motivate tool vendors to adopt open exchange standards? Very good. 
So there, so you're a tool vendor, and actually you want some incentive, and typically you measure based on financial incentive. So how is it that you adopting a standard can make you money? Well, on the one hand, your competition supports a standard and more people use your competitor's tool than your tool, or else you define an integration path that your competition does not support. Or in the case of the group that sponsored this particular presentation, uh, the A&D PLM Action Group, this group here at the bottom, is that they unify in some of those decisions in order to influence the tool vendor community. So yes, um, a bigger party has a lot more influence. So if, if several of the OEMs agree that this is the path we're going because of the shared capability and value to our business, it may result in a tool vendor adopting data standards. And talk, let's think about 3D MBD and our transformation from drawings to digital CAD. And now just about every PLM vendor supports an interface with a competitor's tool in order to take advantage of that integration. However, that path probably took about 20 years. In fact, the formation of GPDIS was based on some of those original discussions between the different CAD vendors and how we could exchange data. The, the cost is definitely there in many cases to implement a standard. And in fact, I didn't put in a plug for MOSIC. And MOSIC today, it's just now being released as Application Protocol 243. In fact, the formal name is ISO 10303-243. But uh, in layman's terms, we still call it MOSIC. And what it is is an information standard based on the metadata of a model. So you have a model in your repository, in your PLM system, in your direct file directory. And how do you know what's inside of that model? Of course, the name may give you clues, but when there's multiple models of the same type, is it a V1, V2 that explains the differences? No, it's the metadata. What are the different parameters? What's the intent? How many versions has it been through? Who created it? That is AP243. And so in terms of exchange, and specifically in the case of architecture exchange, we think the tool vendor's transition to a MOSIC data standard will probably enable not only architecture, but more model exchange than any other standard identified on this list. So I'm getting a new question about the auto industry. So good. Now it just so happens the auto industry has a very similar group to uh, the A&D PLM Action Group, and it's called the GAG, the G-A-A-G Group, uh, Global Automotive something group. It escapes me the acronym, but the GAG is essentially a very similar consortium looking after um, the, the, in, the interests of multiple car companies. And just about every automotive industry is a member of GAG. And they have some of these same conversations. And in fact, we have had a data exchange with the GAG over priorities. And this is certainly, this architecture exchange is one of their priorities. But also the case is, is that in, in, in aerospace, there's really a, a smaller group of OEMs, while in the case of worldwide auto production, there's quite a list of companies. And in their particular supply chain model, they still have a tendency to dictate to their specific suppliers what tools and standards they will use. But uh, 
they kind of have a million dollar manufacture a million unit manufacturing expectation while in the aerospace industry we're talking tens hundreds maybe a thousand so the quantity is not necessarily there to dictate to absorb the cost of common tools throughout the supply chain and i hope that answered your question but yes the um, the auto industry, multiple automakers are have a big role in that SysML V2 development just for that reason. Anything else? Like I said, is that I'll I'll try to take uh, an audio question if. That's easier uh, for someone. So, Mark, I put it in the chat, but I said, as as the tools and modeling language modeling languages mature, do you see a more unified solution being implemented? Uh, for example, the MBC architectures that everyone creates will only be done in something like SysML version three or whatever new, more unified language is created down the road. Okay, so the technology is changing. And what we're seeing in the, from the PLM vendors is more of a unification of capability. Okay, they might have a specialized interface for architecture authoring and another specialized interface for uh, behavior modeling and how to manage your requirements. But now we're beginning to see kind of a transition of capability where one tool does multiple things. Thank you. And in which case, look at SysML. You can now uh, essentially run, a, run the control panel for your analysis from within the SysML model. And the spec is growing to continue to support that. Also true for requirements. How you can interface a requirements management tool, a database, with the SysML model and keep the model up to date as requirements change. So in the case of data standards, those data standards don't really exist where it merges these different technologies. We are just to the point of formalizing uh, how, what the ar standardized architecture representation looks like. And look at this picture. I mean, in the CAD world, there might be three or four uh, meaningful data standards for exchange. In MBSE, it's all over the road. There are There is a, uh, a wide group of um, capabilities needed for that early design, conceptual design representation. So the standards business um, really hasn't moved toward unification yet in MBSE. Back in the CAD, early CAD days, I think I can name four or five different CAD standards that have all now come together in step 242. But it used to be there was iGEST and ProModel, there was all these different exchange standards that, that were used to exchange CAD. And over the years, they converged into a single standard. And hopefully it doesn't take MBSE technologies that long to do some, have some of the same uh, merging capabilities into common standards. Um, doesn't like there's any more questions. Thank you, Mark, for that presentation. Uh, we'll take a six minute break, come back at noon Pacific Standard Time or three Eastern Time to hear from Phoenix Integration. <laughs> 